Hello and welcome to The Game Was Better, where things pop up and I shoot them. I'm still working on that. Anyway, Crimson is off trying to find new ways to recover his sword, is probably what he wants me to tell you. In actuality, he's working on a book and has horrible writer's block. You have no idea what kind of hell this is! So while he's doing that, we're gonna check out The Prince of Persia! When people think of the Prince of Persia series, they most likely think of the Sands of Time trilogy, which gave us the Sands of Time, the Warrior Within, and the Two Thrones. In each of these titles, time manipulation is a central aspect of gameplay, allowing you to slow time, stop time, or, most commonly, reverse it when you miss that one stupid jump! The Prince of Persia series is actually older than what some people realize, going back to 1989 as a side-scroller. The series was created by Jordan Mechner, who also wrote The Sands of Time. It told the story of a brave prince rescuing a princess from an evil vizier. Sound familiar? I can show you the world Shining, shimmering, splendid This series continued into a trilogy, ending with Prince of Persia 3D in 1999. It was relaunched in 2003 with the highly successful Sands of Time trilogy, and introduced us to not only the Dagger of Time, but a brand new form of action-adventure platforming that was unique and challenging back in its day, which has since been pounded into a uniform pace by the Assassin's Creed series. But at the time, it required you to be observant, quick-witted, and maybe use the Dagger of Time to undo your mistakes. Then it got rid of that in the next relaunch in 2008 when the parkour controls were changed so you could get by through holding down a single button. But the Sands of Time trilogy is still most people's favorite, which also gave us the voice acting of Yuri Lowenthal for the otherwise nameless prince, along with a series of witticisms to make the prince a very likable character. Jump to 2010, which gave us the new Jerry Bruckheimer-backed live-action film for Prince of Persia. I think many people were apprehensive about this because... It's a video game adaptation. Name one that doesn't suck. However, much like The Hunger Games, this movie had the tremendous advantage of having the original creator working as a writer. Jordan Mechner came into the project knowing that several things would have to change, but seemed optimistic about the experience. The prince was given the name Dastan, which Mechner was informed meant trickster in Old Persian. And he was played by Jake Gyllenhaal. It's pronounced Yelenhulehe. Ugh, whatever. The movie earned mixed results critically and earned only $90 million domestically, which sounds good until you hear the $200 million production budget. At least the international market helped them get to $336 million. Part of the problem was that a lot of people got up in arms about Yelen Hulehe playing a role that they felt was meant for a Middle Eastern actor and accused the movie of whitewashing. And although some people might enjoy talking about this particular aspect, Crimson has a strict no-politics rule on his channel. Hey, we've got a good thing going here. Don't screw it up. Ugh, fine. While I think it would be great to get someone like Dev Patel involved in a part like this, Yelen Hulehe does still bring a good performance forward. Is there finally one video game adaptation that's at least passable? Well, let's find out for ourselves as we insert easy pun here. Crimson, your template sucks! The movie opens by showing us the prince's humble origins. When Prince emerged in the late 1970s, few could have imagined the power he would soon hold in popular music. No! Wrong prince! Rather than being born into royalty, Dastan was born on the streets, apparently as an orphan, with only his friend Bees and a knack for acrobatics. <laughs> After standing up for his friend, Dastan earns the king's interest and is adopted on the spot. Some people might call this kidnapping, but screw the rules, I have money! This change was made to establish Dastan's acrobatics, something which might seem a little odd if he had grown up in a palace. My prince, yeah. those beams cannot support your weight! Stop yeah. swinging on the- Well, shit. Meanwhile, in the future! Dastan is joined by his older brothers, Tuss and Gazriv, and their totally not evil uncle, played by Ben Kingsley. 
Or it'll turn out that Ben Kingsley was a red herring and Guy Pierce was the bad guy the whole time. I am the Mandarin! God, Iron Man 3 sucked. The neutral, holy city of Alamut is deemed a threat to Persia, so the brothers decide to raise it, with Dastan being the only one to actually win the battle, along with his squadron of misfits. Don't get used to them, though. Only one of them gets a name and he dies in, like, 20 minutes. As the battle simmers, Dastan manages to take the coveted Dagger of Time from a courier, not knowing what it really is. He just wants it because it's shiny. Defending the city of Alamut is Princess Farah, played by Gemma Arterton. Princess Tamina. Or they went and replaced her for the movie. Why? At first, you'd think it was just a minor cosmetic change. After all, a name in and of itself isn't terribly important. But then you notice that her character is different in a few ways as well. She still fills the role as a willful, determined princess, though Tamina doesn't actually use a bow in the movie, or really fight that much. She's not a bad character, she's just not nearly as dynamic as Farah. I'm just glad they didn't make Tamina like Navi. Hello? Look! Hey! Listen! Hey! Listen! Watch out! And from here, the storyline completely takes off on its own. There's almost nothing in common between the movie and the game, aside from the prince getting the dagger, the female hero joining him, they go through a place, an end boss happens, roll credits. But I can't fault the movie for this because the game had almost no plot. It was all about the journey from point A to point B within a single palace. It was just driven by the prince and Farah chatting together, fighting together, and solving a few puzzles here and there. Although I will never understand why a single banister hanging 20 feet up is designed to unlock a door on the other side of the room. Whoever designed the security system in that palace needs to get fired. My point is that they had to add a lot of fluff to the movie to get it to feature length. I'm not saying that they couldn't have done a direct adaptation, but it would have felt flat to a lot of new viewers. Instead, we can just chalk the movie's storyline up as being loaded with some average characters, some obnoxious back and forth as Destan and Tamina fight over the dagger, the movie makes up some characters whose names we won't remember by the credits, a group of assassins swing by to extend the movie, and an obvious plot twist drops in when it turns out Ben Kingsley really is the bad guy Whoa. halfway through the movie. So a lot happens, maybe too much happens, but at least they didn't cut out what the games were all about the combat, and the parkour. While the movie has a number of problems, the combat and stunt work are not among them. To get the parkour right, they hired world-famous stunt artist David Bell to coordinate the action scenes. Some of the more dangerous stunts were done by hired stuntmen, but Yellen did some of his own. All the actors had to go to a kind of boot camp. They had to learn to ride. They had to learn to sword fight. Combine that with some good music, and the action scenes do stand out. It would just be nice if they didn't outshine the writing in so many places. You're... I... The rest of the movie relies on deception, when Destan forgets to give his father a gift, which is apparently what you do after you've raided a holy city. I mean, even when the man you're celebrating contributed nothing to the plot and disapproved of the whole thing. This... adventure won't sit with our allies. So, why is he accepting gifts? Doesn't that make him look complicit? Fortunately, Dastan's oldest brother, Tas, has him covered. I knew you'd forget! The prayer robe of Alamut's regent, the holiest in eastern lands, a gift the king will appreciate. Tamina is also presented as a trophy, whom Tas intends to marry. However, when the king tries on his new prayer robe... Stand this side! Out of my way! The king just burned to death wearing a prayer robe. God must really hate that guy. Rather than do something useful, like send the robe to Uwe Boll, Dastan is immediately accused of murder, so he and Tamina jump out a window, seconds before Dastan's best friend is killed by the palace guards. No, not what's-his-face. He was the best one. Now wanted by the Persian Empire, Dastan has no choice but to rely upon Tamina. I promised my brother I'd kill you if he couldn't have you. Well, the solution would be to kiss me and then kill me. But I have a better solution. I kill you! And your problems are solved! 
During the tussle, Dastan pressed the button on the pommel of the dagger, activating the sands within it, reversing time. And it's so much fun that he does it again! Did you see that? And suddenly, he starts connecting the pieces. Our invasion wasn't about weapon forges, it was about this dagger. However, like the BFG in Doom, the Dagger of Time is massively underutilized. After pressing the button twice, Dastan has run out of sand and can't power the dagger anymore. Keep in mind, it wasn't just able to reverse time. It was also able to pause time for individual enemies, slow time down, or let the prince move incredibly quickly. We shall be married in the morning. Wrong prince. That is so not what I meant. The dagger only gets used twice for the rest of the movie, and it's only legitimately useful for one of those times. And reversing Dastan's suicide was not it. Sand or no, Tamina decides to take the dagger back for herself and go off alone. Dastan then turns this around when he meets Sheik something or other, played by Alfred Molina, and Sesso, the knife-throwing warrior. Oh, I wouldn't even bother doing that if I were you. Do you know why? This is Sesso. He's an embarker. I had the good fortune of saving his life, which means that he is now enduringly indebted to me. The character is forgettable, but Molina does have some solid range as an actor. You'd barely even recognize him from his performance as Doc Ock in Spider-Man 2. Hello, Harry. Dastan then works with the Sheik to take back the dagger and sells Tamina into slavery. Is it too soon to make a Harvey Weinstein joke about this? I wouldn't risk it, I really wouldn't. Not being completely heartless, Dastan does help Tamina escape, and the two of them make it to the late king's funeral, where Dastan runs into his uncle. Your hands are burned. Yes from trying to pull the poison cloak off your father. Something wrong, Dastan. No, no. You're certain? You know you can trust me, boy. So Dastan figured out that his uncle Nazim is the real villain who wants to go back in time to kill the king so that he can take over as ruler. Not the most original plot, but it is set up well enough. Not to mention that Ben Kingsley does kind of look like the vizier from the game, just without the turban or full beard. <laughs> Dastan escapes, so Nazim decides to hire some mercenaries known as the Assassins. Sadly, this is not an interesting Assassin's Creed crossover, though I do have to wonder, who would win in a fight, Dastan or Altair? Dastan and Tamina hit the road again, only to run into the Sheik and his men. Persia! We parted under such rush circumstances, I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. The group gets jumped by the Assassins, or rather their snakes, and the two sides decide to join forces to stop Nazim. Or, in the Sheik's case, steal truckloads of gold. Tamina reveals that the only way to stop Nazim is to return the dagger to the mysterious and hidden Cavern of Time. As interesting as all this is, did you notice the one thing missing from this entire movie so far? One of the more essential elements that showed you just how important the prince's journey was? There are no sand monsters. It may seem like a really minor point, but the setup of the games and the inclusion of these enemies was vital to giving the prince's quest an air of importance. These enemies were a constant not just the Sands of Time, but the rest of the trilogy, and the Forgotten Sands later on. And while the story we get isn't really bad, it does feel like the stakes are a little lower. In the games, the prince often fought alone as one of the only people left uncorrupted by the Sands of Time. He was secluded, vulnerable, and also the last hope to restore order and correct a mistake that he had made when he released the Sands from their prison. That sense of isolation is gone in this movie, and it's one of the more subtle effects missing from the adaptation. The closest we get to the Sand Monsters is the Assassin Gang later in the movie, and they're still a far cry from how dangerous the real monsters were. Or the Dahaka, but we're not getting a sequel, so what's the point in complaining about that? Anyway, Dastan, Tamina, and all the Sheik's men find the secret cavern of time and discover that the villagers have all been slaughtered by the Assassins. 
Wait, if that's a secret village, then how did the assassins find it first? But then we remember that Gazreev was also chasing Dastan, and he finally overtakes them. But Gazreev's rage is tempered with only a minute of conversation. We are brothers. Touching words with my sword at your throat. You often question why father spent so much time in prayer. Before he died, he told me that the bond between brothers is the sword that defends our empire. He was praying that that sword remain strong. Why would I go into Avrat for father's funeral when I knew it was so dangerous? I have no reason to believe you, but I believe you. Well, it's a strained alliance, but it looks like Dastan has earned a powerful ally in this war. <laughs> well, crap! What was the point of any of that? If pointless characters weren't enough, Tamina loses the dagger to this snake charmer guy suffering from more burns on his face than Colonel Vulgen. Although, as much as I complain, there is something clever that the movie did here. See, these assassin guys may look like generic baddies, and for the most part they are, but the movie was able to slip in some subtle touches here and there. For example, this whip guy is actually using the dagger tail, the weapon that the prince gets embedded into his arm during a cutscene in The Two Thrones. And if you look closely at Dastan's armor during the Alamut attack, don't you think it looks very similar to his armor from Warrior Within? So there are several complaints to be had about this adaptation, but it can be subtle. It's not entirely heartless. So our heroes head to Alamut to recover the dagger and save the day. Sesso climbs the tower holding the Dagger of Time, and fights the one guy protecting the single most important part of Nazim's plans. Yeah, okay, so 10 out of 10 for style, but minus several million for good thinking, huh? Ben Kingsley has an entire army at his disposal. Why does he have one guy protecting this thing in an isolated tower where backup can't get to him easily? Not a great plan. After an otherwise enjoyable fight scene, Sesso and the assassin kill each other, but not before Sesso chucks the dagger out the window. Now equipped with the dagger, and after the sand is replenished thanks to Tamina's backup supply, Dastan goes to Tuss to explain how the dagger works. By killing himself. Interesting tactic. But Tuss uses the dagger and sees that Dastan was telling the truth. Your Majesty, the soldiers tell me that... I see that Dastan has indeed returned. Tuss, remember what I told you! <laughs> Seriously, again? Is Dastan cursed so that everyone he proclaims his innocence to dies? That makes two characters who died immediately after switching to his side, and neither of them were terribly important to the plot. This is why Jordan Mechner should only stick to using a few characters, because any more than that and he doesn't know what to do with them. Now that Nazim has the dagger, again, he heads underground to reach the sand glass, a massive tower of crystallized sand that, when stabbed, I don't know, rolls back time? Nazim apparently just needs to stab it with a dagger to reverse time and make himself king, but Dastan ends up doing the same and reverses time just enough to stop it all from happening. It's kind of a mess. The game just had a big hourglass instead. Kind of self-explanatory there. It just holds the sands and unleashing the sands dooms the kingdom. No more questions needed. We get one more fight scene with the assassin leader running in to stop Dastan from reaching the sand glass. <laughs> Just tell him you're innocent, it's killed everyone else so far! Dastan wins the fight, then he and Tamina confront his uncle. This should have been an extremely one-sided fight considering Dastan can wall run better than Spider-Man, but Ben Kingsley is apparently very strong for a 70-year-old man. Dastan! I never understood why my brother brought trash into the palace. Enjoy the gutter, Dastan. It's where you'll stay under my reign. Nazim! Don't use a dagger down to your path! It will unleash! Unleash what? God's wrath! Hell itself! Yeah. Tamina sacrifices herself so that Dastan can win the fight, and since he told her he was innocent earlier, I'm including this in his KDR. But Dastan eventually overtakes his uncle and finds himself holding the dagger in the immediate aftermath of the Siege of Alamut. Seizing the opportunity, he runs to his brothers to tell them the truth. Brave soldiers of Persia! We have been deceived into attacking this holy city! Alamut has no weapon for you! Dastan! Have you gone mad? I cannot stand silent in the face of treachery. This war was set up by one trusted above all else, our Uncle Nizam. Dastan talks with Tuss over what really happened, but rather than die this time, Tuss decides to question the spy that told him about the supposed weapon forges in the city. 
Now, even though there's no hard proof against him, and even if there was, he could probably weasel his way out of it, Nazim grabs a sword and tries to kill Dastan. It doesn't go well. To make amends for sacking their city, Tuss suggests to Tamina that she and Dastan get hitched. So, how does that work? Tell me, Prince, how exactly did you picture this conversation going? Oh, I'm sorry that I murdered half your civilian population and most of your military force, but here, have my brother as a husband. That'll make everything all right. Do you think that'll just make me forget about everything that just happened, the wholesale slaughter of my people? No. You, sir, can go fuck right off. Also, why is Tuss not putting himself up for marriage like he did before? Is it because Dastan earned that right this time around? Just like before? Who cares? The movie closes with Dastan and Tamina walking around in the garden, with only Dastan remembering the whole adventure. I loved the games and I would recommend them to anyone, but the movie left me feeling very conflicted. First of all, this movie is not bad. It has a lot of questionable choices, but it is first and foremost an action movie. The action is the strongest part, so it succeeds with that, but the writing doesn't hold up nearly as well. The characters are either bland or entirely useless to the plot. You could actually cut the Sheik, Tuss, and Gazreve out entirely and it wouldn't change a thing aside from the brotherhood angle the movie was banking on. But otherwise, the story is just... average. Each scene is just there to get us from one action scene to the next. At least the acting is good, which isn't a surprise considering the cast. If you want to watch a movie for the action, then you might like this. It gets a 3 out of 5. I'll try to stop from going all fanboy on you, but I don't have enough time to explain how awesome these games are. The characters are fun, the music is great, the writing is okay, but oh boy, those parkour sections are incredible. Nothing makes you feel quite as good as getting the timing on a jump just right or figuring out another room-sized puzzle. They just keep putting out hit after hit until the 2008 relaunch. But anyway, the Sands of Time trilogy all earned high marks across the board. Video game adaptations have a bum rap, deservedly so, but this adaptation may be the one movie to almost make an exception. Is it perfect? No, hardly, and I think I've made my case within this video. While there are several problems, the movie did do a great job with the parkour and the combat, and isn't that the biggest element from the Sands of Time? It doesn't contradict the source material, it doesn't completely change the protagonist's character, and it doesn't have any massive BETRAYAL! Right now, we could just look at this as one of the biggest accomplishments in game adaptations. Unless we count tabletop games, because then Clue wins by a landslide. As an adaptation, Prince of Persia gets a 3 out of 5. <sighs> well, that's enough out of me. I'm gonna get out of here so Crimson can have some peace and quiet to write in. Everything I create is terrible! Ugh, writers. Whatever. I'm gonna go finish the new South Park game.
oh, hey, guys, you got anything to drink? I'm dry as a bone up here. Oh, <laughs> I may be dead, but I still got my funny bone. <laughs> but I'm dish. I'll be here all week, guys. Thank you.